When Tom was seven, his family moved from the small village of Milan, Ohio, to Port Huron, Michigan. He was enrolled in the public school system, but had to be removed three months later due to his difficult demeanor. His schooling was further limited by his family's economic hardships, so those three months would constitute the only formal education he would ever receive in his life. Tom's mother taught him to read and write and showed him how to use the resources at the public library. By the age of 12, Tom had read numerous history, poetry, and science books, including several works of applied chemistry. By 29, Thomas Edison was a respected inventor and had created the world's first industrial research lab in Menlo Park, New Jersey. In 1877, Edison invented the phonograph. Capable of recording and reproducing sound, this device marked the dawn of the first new mass medium since print. That same year, he took a commission from Western Union to improve on Alexander Graham Bell's telephone. The technology was eventually licensed back to Bell, and it helped create the largest telecommunications monopoly of the 20th century, the American Telephone and Telegraph Company. With the support of financier John Pierpont Morgan, in 1878, Edison began to develop a commercial light bulb. After much experimentation, he filed a U.S. patent which described a carbon filament electric lamp. This event marked the birth of General Electric. While Edison was developing his light bulb in New Jersey, California Senator Leland Stanford was in Palo Alto settling a bet. The railroad tycoon financed an experiment by photographer Edward Moybridge to show that, for an instant, all four hooves of a speeding horse left the ground. Stanford was proven right, and countless equestrian paintings were proven wrong, as they consistently featured galloping horses with their front and back legs extended. In one of the most fascinating cases of hyperreality, not only did observers fail to notice the discrepancy between image and nature, but for a while, artists actually refused to adopt the new forms, calling them unesthetic and grotesque. Moybridge's experiment deeply affected the medium of painting and gave birth to a whole new medium by delivering the first photographic motion picture. But Moybridge didn't invent the movie recorder. His sequence was captured using 24 evenly spaced photographic cameras, their shutters triggered by tripwires. It was the French scientist Etienne Jules Moret who in 1882 invented a camera capable of capturing 12 consecutive frames per second. Closely resembling a shotgun, Moret's device originated the idea of shooting on film. In 1894, two machines developed by William Kennedy Dixon at the Edison Labs made their commercial debut in New York City. With the kinetoscope and the kinetograph, as well as the U.S. rights over raw film, Edison effectively held all the patents required to record and reproduce motion pictures. In December 1895, Auguste and Louis Lumiere held the first public screening of films at which admission was charged. As Edison followed in their footsteps, the Penny Arcade peep shows gave way to the Nickelodeons. The movies became a popular pastime and a new industry emerged. In 1908, Edison created the Motion Picture Patents Company to enforce license compliance by all producers, distributors, and exhibitors. A group of independent filmmakers led by Carl Lamley, William Fox, and Adolf Zucker resisted the impositions. As the underground market grew, the MPPC hindered independent productions by destroying unlicensed equipment and marginalizing theaters which showed unlicensed films. With the intention of escaping Edison's reach, many independent filmmakers moved as far away from New York as possible. In California, they found sunny skies, diverse landscapes, and inexpensive non-unionized labor. There was also a nearby Mexican border to run across if escaping the law became necessary, but few ever did. Most stood their ground, fought, and eventually defeated the Edison Trust. From this group of creative outlaws who refused to comply with intellectual property law, Hollywood was born. By 1924, the independents had founded some of the world's most enduring production studios. And in 1928, 
an American icon loudly announced the arrival of a new era in film. After years of silence, Leo the Lion roared at audiences for the first time. 1928 was also an eventful year in the history of aviation. Charles Lindbergh was awarded the Medal of Honor for his first transatlantic flight. Amelia Earhart was celebrated as the first woman to fly across the Atlantic. And in his first public appearance, Mickey was mostly ignored as he attempted to flirt while flying an airplane. In May 1928, United Artists released Steamboat Bill Jr., a silent comedy masterpiece starring Buster Keaton. Six months later, Disney released his animated version starring Mickey. And where a silent plane failed to grab much attention, a whistling boat worked miracles. Steamboat Willie became an instant classic. Following Steamboat Willie, the list of productions that freely borrows from the works of others is quite significant. Snow White, Sleeping Beauty, and Tangled are based on the work of the Brothers Grimm. Pinocchio on the book by the Italian author Carlo Collati. Bambi on a story by Austrian writer Felix Sultan. Cinderella is an ancient Chinese tale popularized in the West by French author Charles Perrault. Alice in Wonderland is based on the work of British mathematician Lewis Carroll. The Jungle Book on a story by British poet Rudyard Kipling. The Little Mermaid is based on a fairy tale by Danish writer Hans Christian Andersen. Beauty and the Beast on the work of French author Madame Gabrielle de Villeneuve. Aladdin on a story of Syrian origin incorporated by Antoine Galland into the book of One Thousand and One Nights. The Hunchback of Notre Dame is based on Victor Hugo's classic, Tarzan on the writings of American author Edgar Rice Burroughs, and Treasure Planet on the writings of Scottish adventurer Robert Louis Stevenson. Even The Lion King, which Disney claims as an original story, bears a striking resemblance to Azamu Tezuka's Kimba the White Lion. In general, though, it would be a mistake to pass negative judgment on Disney. Transformative work is vital for the evolution and dissemination of knowledge, and most of us would not know these stories if it wasn't for Disney's luminous reinterpretations. As the creator of the first full-length cell-animated feature, Walt Disney has earned a rightful place in history as a true visionary. As visionaries go, few have had the historical impact of English physicist Sir Isaac Newton who declared that the same force that made an apple fall to the ground was keeping the sun and the moon in their place. This revolutionary conclusion forever changed our perception of the universe. When the Law of Gravitation was published in 1687, it appeared to be a work of absolute originality. Yet Newton acknowledged, If I have seen further, it is by standing on the shoulders of giants. Just like Newton, Disney reached further by standing on the shoulders of giants. And he was able to climb on their shoulders because, back then, the freely available resources were substantial and relatively young. Many works were not copyrighted, and those that were passed to the public domain in an average of 30 years. But more importantly, transformative work was rarely regarded as a form of copyright infringement. If the average 1928 copyright term still applied, you would be free to create a video game based on the movies Rocky, Star Wars, or Planet of the Apes. Even if the copyright holder applied for a 28-year extension to get the maximum 56 years, today's film graduates should be allowed to produce their own renditions of Batman, James Bond, or the Looney Tunes. Emerging publishers could release graphic novels based on Asimov's Foundation, Bradbury's Fahrenheit 451, or Heller's Catch-22. CGI animators could reimagine Goofy, Superman, or the works of Dr. Zeus. And theater groups would be able to mount a musical based on the movies Metropolis, Singing in the Rain, or Citizen Kane. All of this without having to worry about copyright clearance fees or legal repercussions. <laughs>